Let's talk about how we can use Eclipse to write, build, and uh, run parallel programs, both on the local desktop computers and also on a remote uh, cluster. In order to uh, work on parallel computer programs, you'll need a plugin for the Eclipse environment. This, uh, um, this is the the homepage of the Eclipse www.eclipse.org this is uh, sort of the, uh, the, the home page and uh, we'll have to navigate to its download page let's click on getting started and then download packages and this time we're going to download last time we downloaded this one Eclipse IDE for C, C++ developers but this time we're going to have to uh, download this one Eclipse for parallel application developers and uh, it's got lots of different uh, versions again it's got uh, for, for, for Linux you have 32-bit 64-bit and you also have versions for Mac OS X and uh, Windows so you can pick the one that's kind of suitable for your needs so we're gonna download f for my for my case I'm gonna download the 64-bit Linux version and then click on download Save files. After the download is completed, you can go to the directory where you store your downloaded package. In my case, it's uh, the downloads, the downloads subdirectory in my home directory. So I can get navigate through there, and then we can take a look at the we can take a look at the the, the table that we have just downloaded. And uh, to extract this table, we can just uh, tar xzf followed by the name of the table. And then it's going to generate a subdirectory that's just called Eclipse. So, so now you have a subdirectory that's called Eclipse. If you go into the, the subdirectory, you're going to see an executable Eclipse. So in this case, you can just uh, move the whole subdirectory Eclipse to a system-wide directory, say OPT. So for now, I have an old version of Eclipse that's stored under OPT. I can just uh, so if I just uh, sudo rmrf opt eclipse, I'm going to delete the old version. And then I'm going to move the eclipse that I just extracted from the down from, from, my, from my table, from, from the table that I just downloaded to opt. Again, doing a sudo. Now if you look into opt eclipse, it's going to have the latest version of our uh, Eclipse and at this point you can go to Eclipse launch Eclipse and it's going to show the, 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 the splash screen for the Eclipse IDE and it, this time it's going to uh, again it's asking you to generate to use a workspace to generate a workspace I'm gonna accept the default and then it's giving you this welcome screen and in this welcome screen it's actually telling you welcome to Eclipse, Eclipse for parallel application developers and now if you want to go to the workbench directory you can just uh, click on workbench and then it's going to take you to the uh, to the to the editor window to the IDE window by default it's going to open a C, C++ perspective it's got lots of different perspectives the default perspective is going to be C, C++ and at the end you also have other perspectives for example fortune resource and uh, all those perspectives are kind of useful. And now we can sort of, sort of start to sort of write our own uh, parallel programs inside of Eclipse. Now let's try to build a default MPI Hello World application using Eclipse. So uh, I'm gonna launch Eclipse first and it's asking me to select a workspace so I'll select a workspace on my home directory 
that's sort of the default workspace and then OK if it's the first time you run Eclipse it's gonna give you this welcome page and uh, you can look through tutorials uh, overview samples that kind of thing but uh, the important thing is that uh, there's a workbench icon here and you have to click on the workbench and then it's gonna take you to the uh, to the uh, to the to the IDE interface and uh, later on we're gonna talk about uh, this interface in more detail how we can actually use this interface it's got different uh, what they call perspectives is a perspective is basically a collection of views all those for example project explorer this editor window this uh, outline window a bunch of tabbed windows here this is all these are called views and a perspective is basically a collection of views and uh, for now the perspective is shown here it's a C C++ perspective so you can actually click on this icon and select other different kinds of perspectives suppose I choose a perspective that's called a resource and I click on OK then it's gonna change the views the organization of the views or the organization of all the different sub windows if I switch back to C++, it's gonna take me to this uh, to to this interface. So 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 we're we're gonna talk about those uh, those int this ID interface in more detail in a, in a different video. But uh, now let's uh, try to just create a parallel MPI uh, default project and uh, see how we can actually configure and uh, run this uh, this project. The first thing we're going to do is to right click in the project explorer and then choose new from the drop down menu and then you have a bunch of uh, choices for now you don't have a project so the, to the, the, the top choice is a project so we're going to choose a C project we're going to choose a C project and then it's going to bring up this uh, dialog box with C project that's kind of in the title bar and then you have to specify a project name that kind of thing but what we are going to do is that we're going to select a default MPI Hello World C project we can just click on this thing and then we are we need to sort of select the tool chain if I have Intel Fortune tool chain this kind of thing I can use that but I don't have it all I have is the Linux GCC tool chain and then give it some kind of a uh, some 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 project names let's say MPI hello world hello world and then let's just click on next here it's uh, it's actually showing you that the default location for this project it's gonna be a subdirectory inside your workspace so so this workspace was specified when the first time you start the Eclipse application so it's asking you to pick a workspace and uh, MPI hello, hello world this is gonna be a subdirectory inside that workspace and don't forget to choose the MPI hello world C project and then Linux GCC as your tool chain and then just uh, click on next uh, here you can type in some of your uh, information like author copyright notice that kind of thing um, that's it now now you have to sort of specify some kind of uh, important things about the MPI library and how it's actually installed on your system so how do you actually find out what's actually your MPI setting right uh, MPI what I was telling you MPI is basically just a library that you can uh, link with and uh, it's got lots of applications it's got lots of uh, functions inside of it and those functions can be used for passing messages and handling messages that kind of thing so it's basically a library so you have to install MPI library the MPI library on your uh, operating system first before you can actually uh, sort of answer all the questions on this dialog box right so here you have an MPI compile command the reason that this particular section is grayed out is because 
you have picked a use default information. So you have to sort of select add MPR project settings to this project. This 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 box has to be checked. Use default information is kind of a uh, is kind of important, but you don't really want to use the default information because uh, usually your default information is like empty for the include path, empty for the library path, empty for the library search path, and then MPI compile command is just the MPI CC, MPI link command, MPI CC. Because it's a C project, so by default it's going to invoke a binding of the C compiler with the MPI. And that binding is called MPI CC. Usually it's called MPI CC. But the problem is that the, the MPI CC compiler and linker itself actually knows how to find the include path and find the library path on your system. But Eclipse doesn't know that. Eclipse, Eclipse doesn't really know where the MPI include path is located. And so, so the problem is that it won't be able to find all the names that's kind of MPI specific. In, in, when you when you are actually trying to edit the source codes, it's going to report lots of errors, which are actually not errors. Those errors are just because Eclipse doesn't know where to find the definitions of those MPI related names. And you have to sort of give Eclipse the include path. So here's the terminal on my system. I can show you where it is. MPI CC. So on my system, MPICC is kind of located at this kind of location. And you can sort of, does it take a version? It's actually showing me, it's a Ubuntu 4.9.2, it's a, uh, it's a version number. It's a version number of the MPICC. And the reason that I'm saying it's a, it's just a binding of MPI and the, 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 the GCC, the GCC. Is because uh, on my system this MPICC is actually a text file and I can read it. So if I if I do m if I do head, I can see the te text content of this MPICC. Uh, this uh, this particular executable text file. It's basically a script on my system. It's basically uh, just a script. So what I can do is to to look at look at the script. So here it's inside of this script. It's actually telling me the include dir, the MPICC is going to look for header files in this directory. It's used to include mpitch. So I can actually just uh, copy paste this particular path to my to my Eclipse setting. So now I have include path. That's for my that's for my MPI. That's for my MPI. And then it ha also has a lib dir. I can just copy and paste it into my Eclipse window. And basically, in fact, all you need is this thing, is this particular include path in order for Eclipse to correctly identify all the MPI related names in your text editor, in the Eclipse text editor. This one is kind of optional. You don't really have to specify this particular library path. It's uh, if you if you cannot find it, it's uh, completely okay. But 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 as long as the MPI CC can find it, then your build is going to be okay. Now let's do next. Let's click on next. It's asking you to select some kind of a uh, configuration, build configuration, debug release. We're going to pick both, and then let's just click on finish. Now you've got a new project in the project explorer it's called MPI hello world it's a C project if you click on this triangle it's gonna show you the include and show you the source if you click on it again so you got a source file that's called MPI hello world dot C and if you double click on it you're gonna get this window you're gonna get this window which is basically displaying the source codes the source code. You have just the one source code file. That's MPI hello world C, and uh, it's got some. It's got. It's actually doing something quite interesting. Actually, uh, it's actually doing something quite interesting. 
so even though it's a default project but it's actually calling some MPI send and then MPI receive so MPI init is the the, 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 the function that you want to call to start up MPI it's actually giving you some kind of comment and then MPI com rank is a function is an MPI function that you have to call in order to get the rank of each of the processor. We're going to talk about the MPI pro programming paradigms. How, how what what those uh, what those things actually mean? What what do you mean to have a rank for each processor, right? What do you mean? Find out number of processors. This is easier to understand because uh, a MPI program is basically running. In, uh, is a, is a program that runs on many processors and the total number of processors used in this particular run is actually a variable that you can actually find out by using this particular command so this particular command is basically trying to find out the number of processors used in this particular run used in for running this pro pro program and then if my rank not equal to zero I try to construct a message hello MPI world from process something s printf is based constructing a message string it's a character string and then you send this message message you send this message to what to, to where to a destination and the destination is equal to zero which means that uh, if my rank is not zero i'm going to construct this message message and send that message to rank zero so so that's that's kind of a that's kind of a the, the the task for processors that's not so for processors that uh, whose whose rank who, whose ranks are not zero and then this is this portion this portion of the code is for 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 the single processor with the rank equal to zero and it's gonna print it's gonna print f it's gonna print something to the screen and then it's gonna do a receive and the receive is actually wrapped inside of a for loop so source goes from one to the total number of processor and then MPI receive from receive from where from the source actually so here it's actually specifying the source I'm trying to receive a message from the source source has a rank from one to p subtract one so by doing this loop I'm actually the the rank zero is actually receiving the message from rank 1 to p subtract 1 and then it's going to print out the message it's got from as, as soon as it's got a message from one of the sources it's going to print out the message and then that's it that's pr pr pretty much the body of the, of the of the function and then if you want to shut down the MPI you can just uh, call MPI finalize this particular function call and then return 0 so so the layout of this particular source code is relatively simple and uh, if you are not familiar with all those MPI function calls we'll have videos talk about that uh, so so you don't have to worry about uh, uh, the, the exact meaning and how to use those function calls for now but not, now let's just build it and you can click on the hammer if you move your cursor to the hammer it's just gonna tell you what this icon is for build debug for project MPI hello world you can just click on it and if you are gonna get any compiling errors it's gonna be displayed here but now it looks like it's uh, it doesn't have any errors now you have to run it now you can run it run is this button but if you click on this run button it's not gonna run in parallel it's gonna just run on a single processor if you click on it, select a way to run MPI Hello World. If you just select local C C++ application, okay. And then inside of this icon, inside of this console, one of the tabbed windows underneath it, it's gonna it's gonna display just one line. It's ta it's actually printing out Hello MPI World from processor process zero number of processes one. So it's gonna it's not gonna sort of run on many processors it's just gonna run on like one processor if you just uh, click on this button so the reason is that uh, Eclipse doesn't really automatically know how to actually run a MPI process 
uh, MPI code, M MPI application on, on a certain machine, on your machine. It doesn't really know how to do that. So it's basically just a, it's basically just a, uh, run this code as a serial code in the terminal. So that's the reason why you just to see like a run number of processes is just a one. So in order to actually tell Eclipse the way to run a parallel program, you have to sort of click on this angle, uh, click on click on this triangle, and then choose run configuration, run configurations, and it's gonna give you this particular dialog box. So for the run configurations, you have multiple uh, choices: C, C++ applications, Fortran local application, launch group parallel application. What you really want is a application is a is a run configuration for parallel application. So this one is actually a sequential application. You don't really need it. You can just uh, click on this button to delete it. Yes, and then you can just uh, go to parallel applications. Now, what you have to do is to, for, for now, there is no parallel application run for configuration for parallel applications yet, nothing, nothing in here. So you have to create a new one. Click on this button to create a, a new launch configuration. Click on it. Now you're going to see So now you're going to see MPI Hello World that's underneath parallel application. And uh, let's let's uh, uh, and uh, on on the on the right hand side of the window you got you have uh, you have lots of tabs but let's look at the resource tab resources tab first. So so what you want to select is uh, the first thing you're going to select is target system configuration. So if you click on this triangle you're going to get lots of uh, uh, lots of choices for the from the drop down menu. Um, all of them have different actual, have have different meanings and have its own uh, utility. But what we are going to use is called the generic remote remote interactive. We're going to select this one, generic remote interactive. And then as soon as you select the one, it's gonna it's gonna the the the, the grayed out region before becomes uh, highlighted. And what you want to do is to select the local because you're going to run this uh, parallel application on this particular machine where you are running Eclipse. This configura configuration will run a command on the target system local. Do you want to continue? Yes, I want to continue because I want to I want to run an MPI application on my local machine on my on the machine where I'm running Eclipse. So so that's basically pretty much for the resources tab. Now let's click on applications tab. So project MPI Hello World that doesn't have to be changed, and then application program. Application program has to be the the job launcher has to be the job launcher on your local system. Suppose I usually if you are actually building a MPI program on your local machine, usually you run it by using MPI Run or MPI EXEC. Or MPI EXEC. You launch a parallel job using either one of these. And if you do MPI run dash dash help, it's going to display how to actually use MPI run. And in principle, you have to sort of specify only two options to MPI run. No, three options. One is the total number of processor, which is usually followed by dash n. Suppose I have eight cores on, on this particular machine, I do n. And then another option that's dash f, which is actually the, a, a, a list of all the hosts on your, uh, for, for this particular run. And I myself have a, uh, have a, have an example, have an example, which is stored under my, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, this particular file. It's called my hosts under my sort of some 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 directory, and you can take a look at the its content. It's called localhost and then colon eight. Localhost is basically a representation of 
my current machine. Colon, A actually means that I want to launch eight MPI processes on local host. So if the reason I'm, I'm putting a number eight here is because uh, this particular machine has eight core. It has a, it's a, it's a AMD Athlon eight core processor. So each core can, can, can run one independent MPI process. So th that's the reason I'm putting eight here. Of course, I can put four or two or one here. It doesn't really matter as long as it's smaller than eight. I shouldn't get any kind of a uh, penalty. But if it's larger than eight, suppose you put a sixteen here, then I'm for each core on my machine, it has to handle two MPI processes. So every MPI process is gonna just get fifty percent of a single core, and uh, so that's gonna impact my performance. So here I'm actually just giving a core number. So each MPR processor can have like 100% of the CPU time for each core. That's that's the reason I put an A here. So 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 usually you have to sort of just type MPI run dash n the number of processor the number of MPI processor you want to run, and then a machine file. And for my case, it's just a It's just this particular file. And then, so this is the first option, the number of MPI processors you want to launch. That's the second option. That's the machine file to spe specify how the MPI processors are going to be distributed among all the different processors. And then that's the executable. MPI hello world. Usually you run a, a parallel application in a terminal just in this particular way. But how do you actually specify this kind of option in Eclipse? Right. So let's see where my uh, which MPI run is located. It's under user bin MPI run. So inside of the application, the application program is going to be user bin MPI run. That's going to be my application program. Copy executable from local file system. That's not necessary because this is already a local file system. So, display output from all processes in console view. This one you want to this this box you want to check this box, and then for the arguments, what's gonna be the the arguments is gonna be the arguments following this particular application program. So what we have to do is basically to all we have to do is to copy and paste the stuff that's already. The stuff that you need to type in the terminal, for example, n8f, this kind of thing. You have to copy it and then paste it. And then followed by the application name. So the application name, the parallel application name is also one of the arguments actually. So where where it's where where it's actually stored, where the, the application is actually stored. So let's go back to the terminal and try to find out. It's it's definitely inside of the workspace, and if you go inside of the workspace, you're gonna see the project name, and if you go inside of the project name, you're gonna get this is a directory for storing all the source codes, and this is for the the debug build. So if you go to the debug build, you're gonna see the executable MPI Hello World, and you can just uh, copy and paste the entire path of the executable to here. And then what's the name of your what's actually the name of your executable here? And use default working directory, check this box, then that's it. Environment you don't really have to change anything. Synchronize you don't have to change anything. And common you don't really have to change anything. And basically that's it. Basically that's it. You can click on apply and then click on run. Now inside of the console, you're gonna see seven. Uh, no, you're gonna see eight, eight lines. So this this line is from the processor with the rank zero, and then these are from other processors, which which is actually the message constructed on all the other seven processors and then passed, send to the to the to the to rank zero to the zeros processor and then the zeros processor basically prints out 
the message that's constructed on other processors and uh, sort of received by rank zero. So now it's actually running on uh, eight different processors. So if you don't believe me, let's just uh, add a dead loop, an uh, infinite loop. I'm going to add an infinite loop in, in here. So it's going to run forever. Let me save it, build it. And now let me let me run it. Where's my look? Where's my configuration? This one. So now, so now it's actually running. It's actually running on my machine. If I want to sort of take a look at the, the status of the jobs, I can do top. And you're gonna see NPR Hello World. You actually have eight copies of it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You have eight copies of this MPI Hello World application on it. And if you want to sort of stop the ex execution of this infinite loop, you can click on this icon inside of Eclipse. It's called Terminal, uh, Terminate. If you click on it, then it's just going to kill the job. And if you go back to do top again, the the stuff the the, the the parallel program is not running anymore. So that's how you can actually uh, uh, set, uh, set up a default parallel project, compile it, and uh, set up the run configuration for that parallel program inside of the Eclipse. In practice, most of the parallel applications are not exactly run on your uh, local desktop computer where you have Eclipse installed. A local desktop computer has only a few core or a few processors and uh, you usually run your parallel application on a remote cluster which has a lot more processors. Uh, Eclipse actually provides a very nice feature that allows you to synchronize your local copy of the source code together with a uh, remote copy of your source code. And you can set up different build environment, both for your local machine and also for the uh, remote cluster. Um, so, so let's look at one example. That's the MPI Hello World example that we have uh, looked at al already. And uh, this this parallel application was uh, was was stored and also built on my local cluster, uh, local desktop computer, which has just the eight cores. So. If I want to run it on a remote cluster, on a remote cluster that has a lot more cores, what I can do in, inside of Eclipse is to try to convert this, is try to convert this uh, local application to a synchronized application. So inside of the Eclipse window, I can right-click on the project name, and then go down to New. And then inside of the New submenu, I have a choice that's called Other. I can click on other. Now it's actually giving you a select a select a wizard. It's a new select a wizard. Inside of this select wizard dialog box, I'm gonna still pick other. Just click on the triangle next to other, and then there's an option that's called convert to synchronized project. So a synchronized project means that you have you have both a local copy on your desktop and also remote copies, copies on remote clusters. It doesn't have to be just one remote cluster, it can be many remote clusters and all of them are synchronized to your local copy of your source code. So now let's convert to synchronized project and then click on next and then it's gonna <coughs> it's gonna it's gonna ask you to pick a project to convert the project name, we, for now we have just one project actually, MPI Hello World, so we can just pick that project name. And then you have to sort of specify the remote directory. The remote directory has two things that you have to specify. One is the connection. You have to sort of pick a connection. For now I don't really have a connection. So I have to click on New to establish a new connection. It's going to bring up the new connection dialog box and then it's going to ask me for a connection name. I'm going to use the, the name of a remote system. 
and then the host the host information is basically how you actually log in to the remote cluster using SSH so for my case it's a CETUS C -E -T -U -S dot A -L -C -F dot A -N -L dot -V. in your case it could be a complete different host but in my case it's a, it's a, it's a small cluster at the Argon National Laboratory your username and then I'm gonna select the password based authentication but if your remote site allows you to do this public key based authentication you can also do that but for, for me I, I'm just gonna p select the password and then I'm gonna give the password to the remote site I, I have to give the password to the remote site And then just finish. And then it's gonna ask you for for another password. Please enter a, the secure storage password. This is not the password for logging to the remote site. It's just a, for sort of a, a local copy of some kind of a, a local storage, a local storage for 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 some security informations. It's just a for uh, stored on your desktop, so you can give it some kind of arbitrary password. Now I, this is a sort of inside of the convert project uh, dialog box again. So now I have a connection na name. Let's see this. Once you have a connection, you can click on the browse button to pick a directory on the remote system. I'm gonna click the browse button, and then you can just uh, navigate. This is actually a file system in my home directory on the remote system. So if you actually look at my home directory on the remote system, it's uh, basically that's my home directory, and then that's the subdirectories in my home directory on the remote system. I'm gonna pick a subdirectory underneath temp, and I have a subdirectory that's MPI Hello World underneath temp on the remote system, and this subdirectory for now it's empty. I actually just uh, uh, actually just uh, generated this empty directory on the remote system in a terminal and then just click on OK you can you can you can click on modify files filtering this kind of thing uh, how to use it is um, is it will take a little bit explanation but let's just uh, skip this um, button for now but uh, we're gonna, gonna revisit this button later on and then we can just click on next and then sync configuration indicate the default build configuration for each sync configuration. We're gonna um, so for for sync so for local we're gonna choose debug status. We're gonna choose that's that's the that's the configuration for for the remote system. That's the build configuration for the remote system. We're gonna choose release for them. And then you can just click on finish. This kind of build configurations is basically a set of environment and a set of commands for generating those different builds so on your local machine you can use some kind of debug build on the remote machine you can use some kind of release build configuration those build configurations can be changed later or add you can add a new build configurations by yourself it's not really a problem so so for now let's just uh, use these two different uh, build configurations and then you can just click on finish And down there, you can sort of see remote synchronization 0%. So it's going to take a while to actually transfer all the files and uh, all the related uh, metadata onto the remote computer. After you have finished synchronizing the source code and its uh, metadata with the, the remote cluster, you can, you, can, you, can, you can go to a remote terminal. So this button is called Open a Terminal. So it's on your toolbar. It's on your toolbar, and there's a button that's called Remote term Open a Terminal. So this uh, this terminal allows you to look at uh, the files on the remote system. So if you click on this button, it's gonna launch a terminal and then ask you to select connection. For now, we have just the one connection status, and then that's uh, that's it. Click on OK, and then underneath. Uh, 
the, in this view box, you're going to have a new tab that's called a terminal. And inside this terminal, it's actually giving you a terminal on the remote system. That's actually status. CETUS. You can sort of see my my site name. It's it's actually I'm actually on the remote remote cluster right now. And if I do an LS, it's going to display my 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 all the subdirectories in my home directory on status on the remote remote system. And if I go to temp and MPI Hello World, that's where I set up this synchronization location and do an LS, you're going to see a subdirectory called SRC. <coughs> and if you look into SRC, you're going to see the source code MPI Hello World.c. And you can sort of take a look at the, the source code. It's exactly the same. <coughs> it's actually exactly the same as my local copy of the source code. So if you actually have made any changes to your local copy of the source code, it's going to be reflected on on the remote machine also. It's going to synchronize to the remote machine uh, simultaneously. And if you right click on the project name in the project explorer, then you have a option that's called synchronize. So for now there's a setting that's called auto sync global. You can also click you can also click on sync all now. And then you're going to force a sync right away. And then you have a button that's called Manage. If you click on Manage, then you can sort of then you can it's going to give you a Manage Synchronize Configuration dialog box. So for now, you have two different kind of synchronization configurations. One is for local. And then the other one is called is for status. And then you have you have an option that's called set active. If you click on set active, then this the configuration this the build conf the synchronization configuration for the status for the remote side is going to become active. And then you can, underneath that you have CDT build configurations. So for the remote side, you have a default build configuration that's called a release. And for the local side, you have a default build configuration that's debug. And we're going to look at the build configurations for those two different, uh, the settings for these two different build configurations. So for now, Cetus is going to use the release build configuration, and the local is going to use the debug build configuration. We're going to change the settings for the two different configurations in a little bit, and because because the remote machine has a different environment from your local machine, and uh, for example, the compiler on the remote machine is called XLC or X. It's a it's a IBM compiler. So the remote cluster is actually a IBM cluster. The IBM cluster has a different kind of configuration environment. Or compiling environment from my local desktop. My local desktop basically is a, a Linux box, which uses the GNU Linux class, uh, tool gen. But for the remote cluster, it's a different kind of a build environment. It's a different kind of tool gen. And if I if I if I click on status, and then there's a button that's called uh, there's a checkbox use an environment management system to customize a remote build environment. You can you can you can click on it, and then it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna display it's gonna display the available modules on the remote cluster. These modules are specific to the remote cluster actually. In my case, in, for this particular example, it's a BGQ. It's a BlueGene Q system. So Cetus, the remote cluster, is actually a BlueGene IBM BlueGene Q system. It's got lots of a uh, machine-specific toolchain, and their compilers are kind of optimized for their system. For their system, and there's also lots of modules that allows me to, to use in my build environment.
So if you actually try to sort of use a certain module, for example, total view, this kind of thing, you can check on it, click on it, and then click add this this button add to use that selected module in your build environment, in your remote build environment. But for now, I won't choose any of the modules. And then I'm going to just uh, click a cancel for now. But uh, but it's going to be a button that's going to be useful uh, in a little bit while. Now, suppose I would like to change my source code on the local machine. So here, here it's um, it's inside of the Eclipse editor window. And I'm going to change my source code. I'm going to change my source code for MPI Hello World dot C. And uh, what we're going to do is that we're going to write one more line before the shutdown MPI line. We're going to write a infinite loop while one, and then just uh, leave the loop body empty. One means true, so this this loop this condition is always going to be true. So this loop is going to be an infinite loop. It's going to keep looping forever. So now let's click on the save button. So as long as you clicked on the save button, you can sort of see remote synchronization actually goes on. And and if you actually go to the terminal tab and look at the source code, suppose I'm going to look at the the end of the source code on the remote system, on the remote system, and then it's going to display the line that I just added on my local machine. So, so it's automatically syncing with the remote machine as as soon as you actually made some changes to your source code on the local machine. Now let's try to change the settings on all the different uh, uh, on the two different uh, build build configurations. One is the debug configuration that's for the local local build, and one is for the release configuration that's for the remote build environment. But before we do that, let's comment out this infinite loop, just to make sure that we don't forget to. Uh, um, so one thing that you have to sort of make sure that uh, you have to set one of the build configuration to be active. So if you right click on the project name in the project explorer, then you have a menu that's called build configurations. And inside the build configurations, you have an option that's called set active. So here you can choose which one, which one of the build configurations is going to be active. For now, the default, is the, for now, the debug configuration for the local build is active, and you can also choose the second one, the release. And then, if you actually, if you actually specify the release to be the active, to be the active. Uh, build configuration, then all the changes that you make in the following operations are going to be applied on the release configuration. So, so let's still make the debug configuration as the active one. That's for the local build. We're going to build our local project first. And then you can just click on project name again and choose properties. And this is going to bring up the properties dialog box. And what you want to do is to, uh, first of all, you have to sort of Click on the CC++ build, the triangle next to CC++ build. And then the first thing you're going to look at is toolchain editors. You have to select the toolchain for your local build. So for, for, for now, configuration is sort of for the de debug. It's actually telling you you're actually configuring for the debug configuration. And there's an angular bracket active that's actually telling you which one is active. Debug is active. If you click on this drop down menu, drop down menu, it's going to show you two different configurations, build configuration. One is called debug, which has an active next to it, and then release doesn't have active to it. And of course, you can also manage configurations. For example, you can add a new configuration. For example. Suppose we add a new configuration that's called debug status. That's for building a debug build environment on the remote cluster. And, and it, it allows you to copy settings from some existing configurations. For example, let's just uh, 
copy it from the local debug configuration, which is not appropriate for the remote system. But uh, nevertheless, let's just uh, uh, use this uh, simplified one. And then you can click on OK. Now, if you actually click on this uh, triangle, you're going to see three different build configurations. One is called debug, one is called debug status, and then one is called release. All those different uh, uh, build environments. For my local build, I'm going to use the Linux GCC. Um, current builder, I'm going to use the GNU make builder. I'm going to use the GNU make tool to actually build my uh, local uh, copy of the executable. And uh, basically that's for my local tool gen. I'll just uh, click on apply. If you click on cl OK, then this dialog box is going to close. But uh, but we still have other settings that we need to uh, sort of uh, to, uh, to do. Build variables on the C C plus plus build. There's nothing that we need to change. Environment, we don't really have to change anything. Logging, we don't have to change anything. Settings. For settings, there's a few things that we need to sort of worry about. One is the G so so the settings dialog box has uh, has several tabs has has several tabs and inside of the tool settings tool settings you have two things that you have to worry about one is the gcc c compiler and the other one is gcc c linker the compiler is going to translate your text file your source code into uh, object files those are binary files that the the, the computer can understand and GCC C linker is going to link together all your binary objective files into an executable. Because the, ob the objective files, those are binary objective files, may have function calls that kind of relate themselves, uh, that kind of sort of connect themselves. Uh, so, so you have to sort of link them together in order to actually generate an executable. So you have to sort of look into the settings for both the compiler and also the linker. For for now, the compiling command on my local machine is just going to be mpicc. That's sort of the the the, the C compiler, C the, the binding of my MPI library with my GNU C compiler on my local system. And then you have a bunch of options that's for compiling every source code, for translating the text files into binary objective files. Those are the options. One of the options that's kind of important is the dash i option. This dash i option has something that's following it, which is actually the directory for containing the header file. For contain for the header file, that's called. A, let me just uh, let me just uh, close this window for a while. Here you can sort of see these two are for the standard heads header files, but this one is actually an MPI specific header file. It's called MPI.h. It's a text file, but you need to tell the compiler where to find this header file, this text file. And the, 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 the location where you actually specify that is actually, is actually here. You have to tell the compiler where to find that header file. It's mpi.h. And then optimization levels. For now, optimization level is set to zero. The debug dash g is specifying for the debug level is 3 that's that's the that's the, that's for the debug build actually because this build is a debug build w o means our gener the compiler is going to generate print out all the warning messages dash c means that i'm just uh, converting the text file to objective binary objective files i'm not doing any of the linking and then some kind of a message length equals some other kind of options you can change those options. You can change these options in these submenus. So, so dialect, preprocessor, symbols, includes. For now, the includes is uh, you have just one includes, but you can add more by clicking on this button. If you click on this button, it's going to ask you to enter more include paths. This these include paths are going to be append, uh, appended after the dash i 
option flag. Optimization for now it's none dash O zero. If you want to change it, you can just click on it. Click on this uh, drop down menu and then choose the optimization level you want. Debugging for now it's dash G three. It's the maximum. Warnings it's gonna all warning so it's gonna W O. And uh, misc these kind of options. And inside of this, you can add your own flags. For example, if you want to do std equals to c plus plus 14 or something, you can do that here. You can add those options here. And then you can just uh, look at the linker. And then the linker is going to tell you where it's going to find all the shared libraries. For example, in my case, my, most of my shared libraries, including the MPI libraries, are stored underneath this particular directory. This particular directory. And then general libraries. For, for my case, I'm going to link to the MPI library. And misc. There's nothing else that I need to link. And uh, for shared library settings, there's uh, nothing I have to specify. So basically, that's everything I need to sort of configure for my uh, compiler and linker on the local build. And I'm gonna just just click, click on OK, and it's gonna close that dialog box. Now, basically, I can start to build my local executable now by clicking on this hammer button. And if I click on this triangle, I have two options. One is called debug. The other one is called release. I'm gonna click on debug. I'm click on this. And if you go if you go to the console. If you click on the console tab, it's going to show you the messages generated from the build. So build of configuration debug for project MPR Hello World. It looks like it looks like it has passed all the compiling and linking process, and it generated no problems. So underneath the problems tab, there's uh, no uh, problems. Description is kind of empty. There's no problems in the console. It looks like it has finished building it. And as soon as you have finished building it, you're going to have binaries in the Project Explorer. For now, you have MPI Hello World. It's for x86-64, Little Indian. And underneath the, underneath the debug subdirectory, you are going to have a MPI Hello World. That's going to be your executable on the local machine. Now, let's try to configure the remote machine. The, the the, set, the settings for the remote build. <coughs> uh, let's try to build the application on the remote cluster. Um, the first thing we're going to do is to sort of change the active build configuration. So if you right click on this um, project name inside of the project explorer and then go go to synchronize and then you have a set set active option here or you can do you can click on in the set, set active, you can choose either local or status. For now, status is actually checked already. So another way is to click on manage, click on manage, and then you can choose either local or status, and then click on set active. Okay. And uh, there's a third way for doing that is in the build configurations. If you right click on the project and uh, in the build configurations. And then you have a set active. You have either debug or release. You see, it's not local or status, but it's debug or release. But we know that release is associated with status, and debug is associated with local. Or you can click on manage, and uh, you can sort of see which one is actually active here. So three different ways for you to switch uh, or, or activate a different uh, build configuration. Um, so so now so now the, the 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 build configuration for status is active. Now let's change its settings. Again, we go to the properties for the project. The first thing we're going to do is to change the tool gen editor. To change the tool gen, we're going to uh, we're going to click on CC++ build and then click on tool gen editor. Um, now we can sort of see the configuration is for release active. And the release is associated with the status, with the status, the remote build. Um, display compatible tool chains only. This box is checked. Um, I'm gonna uncheck it. 
this way it's gonna give you more options if you check it then it's not it's uh, it's not giving you as many options and we have to uncheck it in order to see one of the options that's kind of useful for us it's xlcc plus plus 2g because what I was telling you is that my remote cluster is a IBM cluster and the IBM cluster has the XLC to OGN that's sort of built on top of it, built on it. I can still use the Linux GCC to OGN on the Linux, on the IBM cluster, but uh, XLC is kind of the IBM provided uh, compiling to OGN, so I'm going to choose this one. And uh, you also have to specify what's actually the current builder. The default is going to go back to GNU make builder. That was also the one that we used for the local build. When we actually built the executable on our local desktop, we used this builder. But for the remote builder, we have to sort of choose the sync builder. If you are actually building on a remote cluster, you have to use the sync builder. So basically, that's uh, that's that's for for Torchia editor. Let's click on apply. And then let's go back to settings. Let's go back to settings. So for now we have uh, we have uh, we have uh, the local XLC compiler and the XLC executable link executable linker. We have to sort of change the settings for these two. For the compiler, the command for the compiler is XL compiler root XLC, and then some options following it. But we're going to change that on my on the on that remote IBM cluster. There's a MPI and XLC binding. It's called MPI XLC, and uh, the MPI XLC actually has uh, default system level system settings for the include path. In fact, this is actually an incorrect path on my remote cluster. Uh, remote cluster because the uh, MPI.h this header file is not stored under this particular directory. On the remote system, but so the the correct include directory is going to be automatically included for the by by the MPI XLC binding. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to delete this particular include path, this incorrect include path. So I'm going to go to input control, and in the input control, if you scroll down, there's a a field that's called specify an additional search path for include dash i. And for now, there's the one that's sort of in there. It's user include MPI ch. This is actually the the, the MPI header include d directory set up when I set up the MPI Hello World project on my local machine. But it's not the correct path on the remote machine. So I'm gonna I'm gonna delete it. So I'm gonna click on this button. If you don't see this button, you can sort of drag this horizontal bar. And then I'm gonna delete it. So dash i is going to be uh, empty for now and then I'm going to do xlc executable linker again the linker on my remote IBM cluster is called MPI xlc again it's a binding that's going to automatically include the correct library search path and this is actually the local it's a search path library MPI library search path for my local desktop it's incorrect on my remote uh, cluster so I'm going to delete it so I'm going to click on library, libraries and paths, and I'm going to click on this button to delete the, this, this line and then delete this line again. Click on apply again. And this time, OK. Let me clean up my console so that it's, um, so I can see the output from the remote machine. So. So now it's um, now I can just uh, I can just uh, build the uh, build the environment. I can build the release copy. The first the first builder is probably gonna have some problems because uh, the release directory does not exist on the remote cluster yet. And let's well, let's uh, let's just uh, see. And it's actually telling me release no such file or directory no rule to make target or stop. So this is actually information. Uh, this is actually an error information that's telling me that on the remote system, which is actually this is actually the the, the directory for 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 the for the for storing my source codes 
on the remote IBM cluster and uh, it's uh, it doesn't exist yet it doesn't exist yet but uh, after this uh, first build it's gonna synchronize so now if I go to the go to the remote cluster by using a terminal if you can open a terminal here by clicking on this button you can open a terminal by clicking on this button and then select the connection you want to uh, use I'm gonna switch to that directory so now it has a release directory when I did the first build it was complaining that uh, the release directory doesn't exist so it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna complain and won't build it won't build on the remote system but as soon as I as soon as I clicked on the build button it's gonna synchronize it's gonna synchronize it's gonna it's gonna generate the release directory on my local machine and then it's gonna synchronize the release directory to the remote uh, cluster so now you can sort of see there's a release uh, subdirectory inside of the MPI hello world on my remote cluster if you're looking to release you're gonna see make file you're gonna see all the necessary files so if I click on this build button again and uh, look at uh, look inside of the console this time it's gonna build it's gonna build so it's actually invoking the XLC compiler first for my source code and then invoking the linker all these are actually happening on the remote cluster all these build process is actually happening on the remote cluster so it's not on my local desktop so this time it should so if you want to look at the details so now the build has finished so if if I look into the if I click on the terminal tab and take a look at what's actually inside of my release subdirectory on the on the remote cluster I should be able to see my executable MPI hello world so so we have finished building the hello world project both on the local desktop computer which is inside of the debug this is this binary should be executable on the should 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 be executable on my local desktop computer and also build it remotely on the remote cluster that's an IBM cluster and you can sort of see the the binary that's under release and the binary under debug are actually different so so the binary that's on my local desktop it's the x8664 that's a intel processor and it uses a little indian it's a little Indian is kind of a Indian format for storing binary data and for Intel computers for 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 computers using Intel processor it's usually the little Indian format and then the the binary that's built on the remote cluster you can sort of see it has different format first of all it's not x86 64 it's PPC 64 it's a power PC and it's a it's a PC that's used in the I, by the IBM cluster. It's a it's a it's a processor that's used by the IBM cluster, and it's in Big Indian. So Power PC actually uses the Big Indian format. It's a different kind of a binary format. So these are two different binaries. This one will run on the IBM cluster, and this one will run on the local cluster, on, on the local desktop machine. Now let's look at how we can run this. Uh, parallel application on the remote cluster we're gonna try to sort of uh, set up a new run configuration for the for this uh, for this IBM cluster for this remote IBM cluster so we start by clicking on this triangle just next to the run button and then we're gonna pick run configurations click on run configurations and it's gonna give you this run configurations dialog box and uh, you have some choices here uh, the one that we are gonna generate is called a parallel application so we click on parallel application and then since we don't have a parallel application for now so uh, for, for the remote system we, we're gonna generate a new one we'll click on this new launch configuration click on this button and now it's gonna give you lots of tabs here the name of the run configuration is called MPI hello world we're gonna uh, keep 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 using that and then in the resources tab we have to pick a target system configuration 
so if I click on this drop down menu and then it's gonna give me a bunch of choices all these all these choices are actually remote are, all, are actually different kinds of job management systems and uh, those job management systems actually make sure that uh, the resources, the computing resources, the cores, the number of CPU cores, the memory, that kind of thing, are allocated in a uh, in a, in a certain uh, according to a certain rule. So if you are actually using some core, some processors running your own job, the job management system is going to make sure that other people cannot submit jobs to those uh, set of cores or set of processors that you are actually currently using so it's not gonna have uh, generate any kind of conflict all those are actually different kinds of job management systems that kind of thing so so what what's gonna happen is that you submit you submit your job to the job management system and then the job management system is gonna wait and uh, it's gonna wait for the resources that you requested for your job suppose you are requesting for like two processors or 32 processors and then the job management system is going to look at the current uh, the current status of the machine and uh, if there is uh, 32 jobs there's there are 32 cores available then it's going to sort of schedule put your job on those 32 free cores or something and if it's not then it's going to wait according to a certain rule and uh, it's going to generate a queue so everyone's job is sort of waiting inside, inside of the queue according to a, a, a rule and the for the remote system, the IBM cluster that we are using, we're going to use the AOCF PBS PG, PGQ batch. This is sort of the remote job management system running on my remote cl remote cluster. So I'm going to select that. And then connection types. It's a remote connection, so I'm going to select the status. That's the remote. Uh, that's the remote machine that I'm going to run on. And then it's gonna give me, it's gonna give me a a, a certain set of a, 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 a another set of tabs. So the only thing that we need to change is sort of inside of the basic PBS settings tab. So you need to give it a job name. Let's just still use MPI Hello World. And then you need to have an account. This is an account that allows you to run jobs on the remote cluster. And uh, if you actually, if you actually uh, have applied for accounts on remote clusters on or on supercomputers before, you'll know what this account actually is. When you actually you apply for an account by submitting a proposal, and then if your proposal gets approved, then you automatically get an account. And every time you you you're going to submit a job or run a job in that machine on that machine. It's going to charge according to that uh, charge to the, the the expenses are going to charge to that account. The expenses is basically the resources that you have used. So suppose you have requested for like a, in your proposal, suppose you have requested for like one million core hours, that kind of thing, and then your account is going to set up with one million core hours inside of it. So every time you run a job, suppose each job costs like one million core hours, or costs like a. a uh, one core hours or something, and then that that amount is going to charge it against your account, and the, the total amount in your account is going to reduce. So that's basically the purpose of an account, and then a queue. For for my for my account on on Cetus, on this particular machine, it's just called GM Seismic Sim. It's just some symbol, some name for 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 representing the kind of simulations I'm doing, and then for queue, queue is a sort of you submit jobs to different queues. It has for a certain set of machine. It, you usually have uh, for for a particular cluster. You usually have different queues, and different queues are for different purposes. So default queue is usually the kind of a batch mode queue. You submit your normal jobs to be, to the default queue, and uh, you also have a bunch of other queues. For example, testing, maybe for debugging queue, for debugging queue codes, that kind of thing, and then queues. Uh, product short for very for very sh short jobs for jobs that's kind of not gonna take a very long time to run that kind of thing so I'm gonna just use the default queue here and then you can specify the total number of nodes you you, you want to run on on these days the clusters actually are organized in a hierarchical way so 
you basically have a cluster, and then every cluster has ha, ha, every cluster has lots of nodes, and then every node has lots of a uh, core. So basically, for this particular cluster, it's it's got it's got a, a large number of nodes, but I'm gonna just request for 32 nodes. And then for every node, it's got a maximum of 16 cores. So for my job, I'm going to use 16 cores, all 16 cores on every node. Here, you actually specify the mode. The mode is basically allows you to specify how many cores you want to use for every node. C16 means you are using all 16 cores on every node. C8 means that you are just using 8 cores per node. Sometimes you want to use those uh, C8, C4, these kind of options because your job, each MPR processor is going to use a huge amount of memory, for example. In that case, using less number of core is going to allow each MPR processor to access more memory, for example. And then leave the environment uh, variable uh, uh, empty. Work clock time, here I'm just uh, using like 5 minutes, using 5 minutes of work clock time. And then so, so basically, that's the basic PBS settings tab. Advanced PBS settings and tab settings and import PBS set, uh, script. These two settings doesn't have to be changed. You don't really have to change anything here. And then you have to go to the applications tab. Again, project is MPR Hello World. You can just use the same name. And then application program. You have to sort of give the complete path to your MPI Hello World application. On the remote system so if you click on browse it's gonna take you to the to the project subdirectory on the remote system and then you'll need to find where your executables are so here I'm actually using uh, MPI hello world here I'm gonna find this executable on the remote system click on OK um, and then that's it for this particular tab. Arguments, if your executable actually takes arguments, you can you can put the arguments there. But for MPI Hello World, this particular application, it doesn't really take any in command line arguments, so it's you can leave it empty. And then working directory. Use default working directory is ticked for now, but uh, you probably don't want to do that. You want to sort of put the because the the job management system is going to generate some out outputs. Where do you want to put those outputs is sort of the default working directory. Is sort of the working directory. But you don't want to use the default working directory. The default working directory is usually your home directory, that kind of thing. You probably want to just put your put the outputs of the job management system inside of the directory where you are actually inside of the application directory. So we're just going to put it in under, under release. Again, using the browse button to navigate to the directory where you actually put your uh, uh, executables on the remote system, and then click OK. Basically, that's everything that you need to do. So now let's just run it. Let's just click Run. And then it's going to say that this launch type allows monitoring of system and job information. Do you want to start monitoring? For now, let's just not. Let's just not do that because it's going to open another perspective called system monitoring perspective and uh, we haven't talked about uh, the different kind of perspectives yet so let's just uh, click no but we can actually look at the status of the job that you have submitted in the terminal so here we have a terminal that's connected to the remote system so if you actually go so here I'm actually under the, my, my project directory on the remote system I have debug release and source if I go into release and then take a look at the the, the 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 stuff that's inside of my uh, inside of my release directory I can sort of these these two these three these three files the the, the files that starts with five six five one nine three are actually from my previous runs um, are from my previous runs of MPI Hello World. So if you want to look at uh, if you want to look at the, the job status of the job that you just submitted, you can use the command that's called qstat, and then followed by dash u dash u means user, and then followed by your username. My username on this remote machine is Pochen, so I can just uh, 
and then now you can sort of see that the job that I just submitted is actually running. It's running on some locations. The CET means status, and then the following sequence of numbers just indicate the 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 rank uh, the rack that contains the nodes the nodes and then the cores that kind of thing. It's just telling you the 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 processors that's actually running my job. So it's displaying the job ID. So the the output of the job management system is going to start with this job ID and then followed by dot and then followed by some kind of a information so error message are going to go into this kind of file the dot error file and then output from your executable is going to go into dot output and then some some information about the procedure for submitting and monitoring the job is going to go into COBOL log so if you actually look at for example COBOL log, this is uh, the log file from my previous run. It's going to display when this job was submitted, then when the, the task was completed, the status of the completion, that kind of information. So now let's look at the status of our job. Is it finished already? It looks like it has finished. It looks like So now you have three more output files generated by the job management system. This file, the log file, and then the error file, and then the output. If we want to look at the error file 565202.error, these error files are actually these uh, con these containing the error files are actually okay. It's not really error messages. And uh, but let's look at the output. But the output is going to be quite long. Let's just look at the tail of the output. And you can sort of see the printout. Hello MPI world from processor 511. It looks normal. The job has finished correctly. And hello MPI, hello MPI world from processor 0, process, number processor 512. Because, uh, because you requested for, I requested for 32 nodes. So 32 nodes times 16 times 16 it's going to be 32 nodes times 16 it's going to be 512 so it's actually because i request of 32 nodes and 16 cores per node so the total number of mpi processes is going to be 32 times 16 it's 512 so that's why the total number of processes is called is 512 here so so that's how you can actually run a job on the uh, submit a job to the remote cluster and uh, monitor its uh, progress and then look at its uh, uh, output status that kind of thing